The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you join us for our webinar on attracting international students to your community. My name is Josh Thompson. I'm with the Economic Development Division of the Ministry of Jobs, Tourism and Skills Training, and I'll be moderating and providing technical support for today's webinar. I'm joined today by my colleague in the Ministry of Advanced Education, Catherine Bolat, who is a Senior Policy Advisor of International Education. I'm also very pleased to have Adrian Conradi, Associate Director of Inter International Student Services and Study Abroad from Thompson Rivers University, and Arjun Singh, a counselor with the City of Kamloops, who will be, both be speaking to their experiences collaborating to attract international students to Kamloops. Before I hand things over to Catherine, who's going to give a brief intro of how the Ministry of Advanced Education is supporting international education in BC, I'm going to briefly run through some tips that will help you get the optimal experience with GoToWebinar. So this is the control panel that you should see in front of you here now. And there are just a few buttons that I'm going to draw to your attention. So this orange button with the right arrow will hide and unhide that control panel if it's in your way of any details on the slides today. This button here will make it full screen, um, just to blow everything up and make sure you can see it as clearly as possible. This button here is the raise hand button. So if you're having uh, any technical issues or, or can't figure something out, feel free to raise your hand and I'll work with you behind the scenes to sort any uh, issues you might be having. And lastly, uh, we will be having a, a robust question and answer period today. So feel free to type your question in any time. And if there is a natural break in the presentation, I'll uh, just briefly interrupt our speakers and see if we can answer that question right away. I'm actually seeing that uh, we've got a question already. So that's, that's great. We're, uh, we're off to a good start. So with, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Catherine Bolak. She's a Senior Policy Advisor in International Education Unit in the Ministry of Advanced Education and has worked there since 2009. Prior to joining the Ministry of Advanced Education, she worked in the Ministry of Children and Family Development in the Policy and Planning Branch. Catherine holds a Bachelor of Commerce from Memorial University and as part of her studies worked abroad in the Netherlands and Ireland, experience which certainly helps her in her current role in international education. In her spare time, Catherine is very active and loves enjoying Victoria's great weather. Next weekend, she and her four-year-old son will be taking part in the Kids Run portion of the Victoria Marathon. Catherine, I'm going to transfer screen control over to you now. And uh, as soon as we've got that set up, uh, feel free to take it away. Thanks very much. I'm very pleased to be here with you today uh, to present this webinar on attracting international students to the community. I'm here representing the Ministry of Advanced Education. Um, I'm here to provide a brief overview of the international education sector in British Columbia. Uh, I'd like to thank my co-presenters today, uh, Adrian Conradi and Arjun Singh, for, for joining us to, uh, to tell this good news story uh, about international education and the way in which they've worked together to create a, a very welcoming environment for international students and a very positive uh, reputation abroad. The economic benefits of international well documented. Uh, the sector clearly generates significant spending, jobs, and revenues for British Columbia. Uh, for example, in 2013, international students spent close to $2.3 billion in the province. <laughs> tuition, living costs, and food, among other things. This translates to uh, $1.6 billion in GDP contribution. Um, and over 25,000 jobs. Uh, the international education sector is actually equivalent to the fourth largest export good and 7% of total exports. So just to, to give you a sense of, of how large the sector is for the province. As you can see, the GDP distribution is uh, focused in the mainland, Southland, and that's primarily because that's where students are focused and that's where the majority of students are located as well. Uh, we're currently in the process of doing a revised economic impact study and the, uh, the results of that will be released in late fall 2015. 
Uh, as you can see, there are multiple partners that work together in the international education sector in British Columbia. So primarily there are four, uh, four ministries, so the Ministry of Advanced Education, the Ministry of Education, Ministry of International Trade and Jobs, Tourism and Skills Training. Uh, the Ministry of Advanced Education has the lead on the province's international education strategy. So uh, as the lead, we're responsible for reporting out on the strategy, but it also gives us the ability to look at the sector um, as a whole, so including pu uh, public institutions, private institutions, language schools, and K-12. The Ministry of Education is responsible for the K-12 sector, including onshore, offshore, and distributed learning. The Ministry of International Trade is responsible for our education marketing managers. So there are a number of managers, uh, education marketing managers, located in uh, BC's offshore, or sorry, uh, the BC Trade and Investment offices, and they're located in China, Japan, Korea, and India. Uh, the Ministry of International Trade is also responsible for promoting British Columbia internationally. The Ministry of Jobs, Tourism, and Skills Training, who, who is uh, leading this webinar today, uh, we work closely with, with that ministry on immigration because uh, that ministry is responsible for the provincial nominee program. Uh, another key partner for the ministry is the British Columbia Council for International Education. They're a crown corporation under uh, the Ministry of Advanced Education. Uh, the BCCID is uh, the acronym for that organization. Uh, they work very hard to, uh, to bring the sector together and they, they undertake a number of initiatives such as Team BC missions to key markets, both existing markets and emerging markets. They do a lot of promotion of British Columbia in uh, countries abroad as well. We work with the federal government for immigration uh, and promotion of Canada. We work with other provinces and territories. We work with communities and, of course, the schools and institutions in British Columbia. Uh, these schools and institutions are really the, the heart of the sector and uh, work very hard to provide a high quality education and uh, learning and living experience for international students in the province. Um, and, and they're obviously doing a great job because British Columbia is uh, continuing to welcome uh, more and more students every year. So international education is a key priority of the government of British Columbia. Um, and this sector is increasingly competitive, uh, both within Canada and on a global scale. So many nations now have coordinated international education strategies. And for British Columbia to remain competitive and to seize the opportunity for growth, um, it was recognized there was a need for a coordinated strategy. So to this end, in fall 2011, international education was named as one of the eight key sectors under the BC Jobs Plan. Um, under that plan, there was a commitment to increase the number of students by 50% by 2016. And there was also a commitment to develop an international education strategy. Uh, other sectors that were named on, as key sectors under the jobs plan include agri-food, forestry, mining and energy, natural gas, technology, and green economy, tourism, and transportation. So uh, in 2012, British Columbia launched our uh, international education strategy, which promotes the two-way global flow of students educators and ideas between countries. Our strategy includes over 50 goals under three, or sorry, over 50 actions under three goals over four years. And we've been working hard over the last couple of years to implement a number of those actions and have made uh, tremendous progress. Uh, we're building on the success of British Columbia's reputation for excellence to ensure both domestic and international students have a positive experience. Uh, in 2014, Canada announced uh, an international education strategy as well, which also included an ambitious goal to increase the number of international students, or sorry, to double the number of international students by 2022. 
The deliverables under our strategy are shared on a number of partners, and we all work very collaboratively to move this forward. So British Columbia currently attracts approximately one-third of the international students that come to Canada to study. We rank second to Ontario. In our most recent data, we have over 114,000 students in the province. On average, about 4% of those students are located in the Thompson, Economic, Tom, Thompson Okanagan Economic Region. Uh, international students choose British Columbia for a number of reasons. Um, our commitment to providing high-quality education, our teachers and institutions are ranked amongst the best in the world. Our Education Quality Assurance Designation, or EQA, so we are the only province in Canada to have such a designation um, that allows international students and parents to recognize a high-quality institution. And that is now our standard for institutions who would like to host international students on study permits. British Columbia is a welcoming and exciting place to live. As you will hear later in this presentation, um, the way that Thompson Rivers University and the city of Kamloops have worked together to support international students. And this relationship has created a very welcoming environment for students. Um, as we know, over 50% of students, or around 50% of students, actually choose their location based on word of mouth. So um, feedback they receive from friends, from counselors. So the positive work that's going on in Kamloops really helps to create that strong reputation abroad and enables the institution, Thompson Rivers, and the school district to continue to attract a number of students. British Columbia's got a world-class standard of living. And the cultural diversity and safety and security in the province are also ranked very highly amongst international students. So international students from the top three source countries do represent 49% of the population. Uh, two markets that are noteworthy of growth include Brazil and India. Um, so as you can see, Brazil has increased, the number of students have increased by 62%, and this is over four years and India 219%. So uh, strong growth from those markets. Um, hope to continue to see that growth and hope um, some other emerging markets continue to grow as well. So as I mentioned previously, we do have a target under the BC Jobs Plan to increase the number of students by 50% by 2016. So we are making strong progress towards that target. Uh, to date, we've increased uh, by 22% or over 20,000 students since two, between 2009-10 and 2013-14. The highest growth rate has been in the private post-secondary sector with 58%. So the private post-secondary sector includes private degree granting institutions and private career training institutions. Uh, the growth in the public post-secondary institutions uh, was second, and that was a 41% growth rate, so that's very strong growth rate as well. Um, and those were followed by K-12 and then the language, uh, the private language sector. So average historical growth has been about 5% per year. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now or join the question period at the end. Great, thanks so much for that, Catherine. Uh, really appreciate the overview, and it's it's really clear. I mean, seeing seeing those numbers in in front of you uh, really demonstrates how big of a an impact international education is to the economy, and it's it's not something that I think a lot of people would necessarily jump to right off the bat as uh, as one of our our main exports. Just as we're waiting for perhaps for a question to come in, I'm just going to launch a, a quick poll just to give us a sense of um, if uh, if we've got anyone who's uh, watching the webinar in a group, if perhaps you're sharing a boardroom or, or something like that. So if I could just get you to uh, click on that screen uh, right in front of you there, and that'll just help us better track our numbers and uh, better uh, our webinar deliveries. Seeing 85%, 90% have voted. 
That's great. Thanks very much. So now I'm going to hand things over to Adrian and Arjun. Adrian Conradi is the Associate Director of International Student Services at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, BC. Prior to his current role, he spent 12 years at BC's first offshore school in Dailan, China. His experiences there are documented in his book, Dragons, Donkeys and Dust, Memoirs from a Decade in China. Let's just see if I can get your uh, webcam up there. There we go. And uh, Arjun Singh is serving his third term on Kamloops City Council. He served on the city's City Hall's Diversity Committee and has done contract work for Kamloops Immigration Services. He currently serves on Economic Development Boards and committees at the local and regional level. In 2014, he helped design and facilitate welcoming, welcoming community dialogues for his community. Arjun's parents immigrated from India in the 1960s. He's married, has one sister, and enjoys his wonderful niece and nephew. In his other, li other life, pardon me, Arjun's family owns and manages apartment buildings, and he's rented to many international students at Thompson Rivers University. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. I'll transfer the screen over to you now and uh, look forward to your presentation. There we are. Okay, hello everyone, can everybody hear us now? Hear you loud and clear. We can't hear you, so okay, thank you. Um, First of all, thanks for having us. Uh, we're, we're excited to give this webinar to, to everybody here today. And I just want to add a little add-on to Arjun's bio and say congratulations publicly for because Arjun was just elected, I believe, third vice president for the Union of BC Municipalities. So, Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, let's get going here. Our, the title of our webinar is Attracting International Students to, to Your Community, but I think um, I want to make clear that we're not actually talking about marketing and recruitment efforts. We're more talking about welcoming international students <laughs> in our community, um, or maybe better put, attracting them to become uh, permanent residents or to stay on. Uh, the other thing that we might, might want to mention right off the bat, Arjun, maybe you could jump in here, is that some of our uh, collaboration between the university and the city is not necessarily formal. And we'll be talking about uh, the sort of ad hoc nature of it. Yeah, so uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Arjun Singh here. Uh, I also want to thank Adrian, Josh, and Catherine for having me here today. And thank you for uh, uh, showcasing our community. And Caleb's Adrian's the expert. I'm sort of supporting cast. He's written a book. I haven't. Um, but uh, certainly from the perspective of uh, the relationship between the city uh, and uh, the University of International Education, it's not really a formal relationship in, in a lot of ways. You know, they they'll call us on on sort of an event by event or initiative by initiative basis, and you know, we're always there to help. Um, I would say that you know maybe 10 years ago when a lot of this stuff was starting in Kamloops in terms of let's say the students from India or enhancing the, the students from China. You know, our mayor went to China. He was at that time our mayor was Terry Lake, and he um, was actually on on a leave from faculty of. Uh, veterinary medicine at TRU, so he was uh, uh, he was asked to go to China by the, the then president and and did some work there, just some events, and then uh, also helped guarantee some of the initial in Indian students to come to Kamloops. So certainly from the perspective of uh, you know the relationship, it's strong, but it's not necessarily a, a, something where we meet about it all the time. It's kind of more of a case by case thing. Okay. So in terms of the number of international students that TRU and Kamloops welcomes each year, uh, we currently this semester at TRU have over 1,700 international students from uh, more than 70 countries. But really this number doesn't tell the, the full story because this number just represents students, international students who are registered in credit-based courses on campus. If we include um, all the students throughout the year registered in credit-based courses, plus the approximately 1,000 international students who come to TRU for non-credit short-term specialized training, 
and we include um, you know the hundred plus students in the school district in Kamloops and SD73 Kamloops Thompson and in the independent schools in the region we're well over 3,000 international students um, probably from over 80 or 90 countries and regions around the world that are that are in our community each year. Now one of the things that uh, that we found very important is to really, it sounds obvious, but to really get to know who your students are uh, so that that can shape the support that's provided. And I'm just going to pull up um, a useful tool for demonstrating the type of diversity that we have on our campus and in our community and also um, uh, sort of illustrate how some of the uh, demographic shifts that occur over time impact the way that we support the students. So I'm, I'm not sure how well everybody can, can read the uh, names on this graph, but in the uh, far right corner of your screen, you'll see that uh, China is our largest uh, source region, similar to the statistics that um, we just saw from Catherine, and, uh, followed by India, and uh, then Saudi Arabia, and Nigeria, Russia, and Ukraine. So you can see a tremendous diversity. What, what's going to happen when I click this little button over here is we're going to go back in time to approximately 20 years ago and you'll see that uh, things were pretty different then. So for example, if I stop right here in 1998, you'll see that the top source uh, countries and regions um, for students, international students at TRU were Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and uh, well, there's a little blip of Mexico, but then Macau. And really, mainland China, it, which is highlighted in yellow, is, is barely, um, barely surfacing there. So a couple of interesting things here, and, and that is, first of all, most of our students were from East Asia, from similar, <laughs> culturally similar uh, places, you know, Confucian-based societies that really value uh, formalized uh, education and higher education. And that definitely um, impacts the way that we support them. Now, if we uh, continue on in time, we see something very interesting. Around the year 2001, all of a sudden, uh, due to government uh, uh, visa regulations and changes, we see the, the massive um, expansion or growth of students from mainland China. And you might wonder, well, you know, well, so what? What does that mean? Well, really, it does change the way we provide support for students because they come with different needs. So 15 years ago, students from mainland China were very much um, closed. They're coming from quite a closed society where they had little, um, little knowledge of the West, where they had very different um, sort of etiquette and, um, and, and norms. And that impacted, for example, things like housing. So during that period of time when we saw a massive influx of students from mainland China at TRU, our homestay program, for example, encountered some difficulties where the, the even things like, uh, for fear of sounding a bit controversial, even things like um, bathroom or washroom expectations and norms were, were incredibly different. Expectations for food, when a homestay family, we're expecting them to provide three meals a day to our students. If they couldn't provide food that students from China were accustomed to or could easily adjust to, that created problems. So we had to make some um, adjustments there. And that's just our first example. If we carry on, you'll see the years uh, changing here. All of a sudden, if we go to 2010-11, we see a massive number of Saudi Arabian students, so, you know, over 400 students from Saudi Arabia um, almost descended upon the city. And some of the interesting things that we need to uh, consider and accommodate with a group like Saudis are, first of all, they're um, predominantly devout Muslims. So you're going to need prayer space on your campus and possibly in the community. And it's not uh, prior to the arrival of the Saudis at TRU, we had a designated multi-faith prayer room. Um, but it was designed for people who wanted, you know, a solitary moment now and again to, um, you know, show their, their spirituality, have a, have a quiet moment. It wasn't uh, able to accommodate, you know, 
several hundred people who all need to pray in a particular way at the same time. So you need to make accommodations and consider things like that. Another uh, issue that popped up with the arrival of the Saudi Arabian students is that that 400, that number of about approximately 400 students didn't represent the true number of Saudis in our community because many of them were married and brought spouses and children. And many of the spouses, if the and I should also add that the Saudi students are uh, predominantly sponsored by um, a, a scholarship program called the King Abdullah uh, Scholarship Program, so sponsored by their government, where the primary sponsored student can bring uh, their dependents as well. So the primary sponsored students, typically but not always, were males. And this meant that their, their dependents, sometimes daughters and ma in many cases wives, were here in our community and not necessarily uh, comfortable going down to the swim public swimming pool for a swim, for example. And they started coming to our international student advisors and saying, what can we do to create um, opportunities for, for the female Saudi students and dependents to socialize and to have an active, you know, normal life? And so that's where some of our collaboration with the city occurred, because at TRU, uh, on our campus and adjacent to our campus, we have an amazing facility called the Tournament Capital Center with an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Well, the Saudi students started asking us, could we arrange to have a women's only swimming time where we put up some uh, barriers so that the public can't peer in on uh, the, the female Saudis who are swimming <laughs> in their bathing suits because for cultural reasons they weren't comfortable with that. And so we did have really amazing support from the, um, from the city and the recreation department there. So that's one example of some uh, accommodations. If we click forward, then we see um, a change. Basically, the Saudi students move into third place and the Indian students move into second place in terms of uh, numbers of students on our campus and in the community. And a very interesting thing when we look at these three groups and compare them is we need to think about what their goals and aspirations are. Why are they here? Why have they come to TRU and why have they come to Kamloops? Statistically speaking, we know that the Chinese students in Canada 50% of them now return home after completing their, their diploma or their degree. The Saudi students, on the other hand, 100% of them, I shouldn't say 100, nearly 100% return home because that's a requirement of their sponsorship. The Indian students, on the other hand, which are one of the fastest growing groups, are, and this is an anecdotal and I'm not backed by um, in any research, but uh, they're predominantly viewing their educational experience in BC as a stepping stone to a pathway to permanent residence in British Columbia or elsewhere in Canada. So the way we support those three groups, for example, is quite different, knowing that some of them are only here temporarily, some are here and will likely become Canadians and their experience as a student is just the very first step and um, we, we certainly want to make sure that we are welcoming all three of those groups but also that we're aware of, of why, why they're here. Uh, the approach that we've taken at TRU is to have uh, really to have um, a, a language and cultural specific uh, support and we really want it to be one-on-one -on -one and personalized. So we've invested at TRU in the largest uh, I and most diverse <laughs> ISA team. ISA stands for International Student Advisor. Uh, so in this photograph, you'll see that we um, we have a large group, you know, eight or nine uh, members. Uh, we currently this photo is a little bit old, but we currently have two Mandarin-speaking advisors, a Japanese speaker, an Arabic speaker, a Swahili speaker a Russian-Ukrainian speaker, and a Korean speaker. So we've matched each of our major cultural groups with an advisor. And uh, that way uh, we know that students who do need that help, they can get it in culturally appropriate ways and within their own language 
um, if necessary. Now, one of the things I wanted to just ask Arjun to talk about, uh, connecting with the last slide as well, is uh, in terms of the different cultural groups that come to Kamloops, as a, as a property manager, did you notice or feel uh, uh, different pressures or needs with each group? Yeah, so um, thanks, Adrian. Uh, so I, I wear a couple of different hats. Obviously, I'm as well as a counselor, I'm a property manager. I'm also doing some facilitation work on uh, welcoming community stuff. Um, with a property management uh, job with our apartment buildings, we have two buildings in Canvas, my family, about seven, eight years. It's quite close to the university. Um, and we certainly noticed a, uh, an increase in international students um, applying or renting from us. Uh, certainly, um, you know, there is a, uh, a little more work to be done there in terms of um, letting them know about the uh, way rentals work in, uh, in, uh, in, in BC and, uh, and uh, we get lots of help from the university with that as well. Um, uh, we also have um, different cultural practices like some people like to bargain you know, for rent which we don't do. Um, other folks uh, don't understand the issues around leases and that kind of thing. Um, you know, it almost is kind of like if you have one tenant uh, that's of a certain cultural group and it works out it well, which they normally do, um, that others come because it's kind of an internal grapevine they have among their cultural or so it's a Chinese you know, community or the Indian community students or the Saudi community students is the examples that Adrian gave. Uh, it's really enriching for, I think, uh, our tenants is generally our tenant base is culture diverse. A lot of other folks get a chance to meet people from other countries uh, and we, we really like that a, a lot in terms of um, having that ability to uh, expose ourselves and do our other tenants to other cultures and uh, typically uh, it, it doesn't take too long for everybody kind of understands a situation and you know we can um, help accommodate things sometimes as well in terms of sometimes um, you know some of the tenants for example from Africa sometimes have trouble um, with their money coming out with their parents so we have to wait a while and if obviously they've been there for a while with us we can understand and we can make you know arrangements that way so it, it does take a little bit of I think um, added flexibility but not, not a lot in my experience. Over to you. Yeah, thank you Arjun and uh, this is a, another opportunity to uh, for me to say thank you to Arjun because as a, a local property manager I'm get a big he, head. <laughs> you might. Uh, he, <laughs> He really stepped up a couple of years ago when we had an unfortunate apartment fire in a property that, that wasn't managed by, by his family, but we had 30 students uh, from TRU who were displaced by this fire. And when, um, as the internet in the international department in international student services, we sought to immediately find solutions, housing solutions for those students. And the city, of course, uh, managed an emergency response center to help assist them as well. But in terms of sort of the, the, the medium term support, that's where as a university we felt that was our role. And uh, it was because of the time of year being I think at the beginning of March or late February, it was tricky to find uh, property managers in the city who were willing to accommodate students for just the two or three months to get them through the school year. And uh, Arjun's um, uh, company he, well, he, we gave him a call and he stepped up and said, I'll, you know, if we have spots, if we have any apartments available, we'll make sure students are housed until the end of the school year until they can get back on their feet or find another solution. So Yeah, I mean, well, and, well, thank you, too, because there's a sort of a motive there around having students stay longer than just the short term. So most of them did, so it worked out pretty well for us, too. Yeah, and it's just one more example of how when we're dealing with international students, we can't have the uh, cookie-cutter approach, the one-size-fits-all they can't be treated the same way that any other person walking down the street who is looking to rent an apartment would be treated because they have very unique needs. And that's why at TRU we've, we've sort of in, invested in developing um, this, this very diverse uh, international student advisor team because it, another example of uh, some unique characteristics of each cultural group and, and, and the previous slide talking about knowing who your students are uh, is that some cultures are much more independent than others and integrate better, while others are sort of notoriously disengaged. And that's where having the language and culture specific support within your team helps. They can act as the liaison, not only to supports on campus, but supports in the community. Um, in terms of this idea of building a welcoming community, uh, even beyond 
um, the university campus. There's a number of things that we do. First of all, we, we engage in social media. So this we can build a sense of community prior to arrival. And TRU is very proud, specifically our international department, TRU World. We're very proud of the fact that we ha now have a half million likes on our Facebook page. And uh, you can um, snoop on a few other universities, even really big ones in places like Vancouver and Toronto, and they don't come uh, anywhere close to that number of uh, likes and traffic on their website. And some research has shown, uh, specifically research done with uh, Chinese international students, that when they engage on social media, they are more likely to engage with other students in the classroom. But if they don't have that sort of safe space with a bit of anonymity, I've said the word wrong, anonymity, um, then it's much tougher for them to engage and make friends and even connect with their instructor, uh, never mind people in the community. Because it, of course, it can be quite daunting to do that as a newcomer. So engaging on social media is a big part of this, pre-arrival. Um, personalized pre-arrival communication, making sure students get a lot of information about where they're coming to, not only information about what they'll be studying and connecting them with academic advisors and things like that, but connecting them to supports in the community. Um, and, and we do that in a number of ways. And the, the third point on this slide is the airport and bus depot reception. And this is one of the ways that TRU uh, stands out. We, we aim to meet uh, the vast majority of our students when they arrive in Kamloops. We want to meet them at the airport or at the bus depot and, and not every um, university or college or private language school is able to do this and, and we also recognize that in some places it, it's not as uh, feasible and maybe not as necessary. But one of my <laughs> colleagues from College of the Rockies um, at a recent uh, international education conference said in a room full of uh, um, people in similar roles as ours, he, he said, I believe that every single international student must be met at the airport to give that first impression that we, you're welcome here and that we care about you. And so that's, uh, again, the approach that we've tried to take. Um, now, there are, depending on what kind of community you're in, there are a number of different options. In our case, our staff sets up a booth at the airport, and this is one of the ways we're liaising with the community and collaborating. The airport in Kamloops has, has very generously uh, provided us a space where we can have a banner and a desk and where we can leave, uh, you know, at the end of the night when the airport closes around midnight after the last flight from Vancouver, we can leave our materials there, and they've even waived the parking fees for our staff on those days and for our student volunteers who are there. And likewise, the Greyhound Station has done the same thing. So that's uh, an area that where, where collaboration is really benefiting the, the first impression to welcome students. Uh, the next thing we do is a, a week-long orientation where we have a number of events um, for students, specifically for the new international students, and we spend a lot of time liaising with local businesses. So whether it's the cell phone providers, because sometimes students, the first question they ask is, you know, where can I get a phone? I need to send a message home to mom and dad. Or, you know, how do, you know, my parents want to wire some money to me, how do I set up a bank account? So we're liaising with those businesses, cell phone providers, the big banks, in some cases, we invite them to come to campus during our orientation, and at, uh, depending on the weather and the time of year, uh, at other times of year, we we get the students. We take a more student-centered approach, and we get them out on a um, a bit of a of a tour of the city, a scavenger hunt, where they stop at various businesses, and um, and get support there. And then finally, we have a a uh, very large welcome reception or party with the, with the president of the university and deans or directors and we always have uh, the mayor or deputy mayor so I'll just pass this over to Arjun too to talk a little bit about the importance of, of that interaction. Yeah I think it's I think it's, it is something where you can use your local uh, council members to uh, you know invite them to these kind of events they're, they're great events or just they're really enjoyable to come to um, and um, you know, provide a bit of a welcome from the community as an official, if you want to call it that capacity, uh, and uh, you know, just sort of give the students the, you know, the the right feeling that you know this is all a team effort in terms of the community as a whole is very excited to have them here. Uh, when we have them now at TRU, there's I don't know probably 
50, 100 countries sometimes in some of those receptions, and everybody gets a bit festive with flags and uh, and uh, have a chance to meet people and talk with them uh, about their various um, cultures. You know, again, it's it's largely a ceremonial role from the perspective of a mayor, deputy mayor kind of a role, but uh, it is, I think, important for us to to be there and to, uh, I, don't think you, I don't think you ever have time no one came. People are always, they're always there. People are always there. Um, and it, it is a priority for us to uh, support the university in, in that way. Just as, an, as a sort of an added thing, I think part of, you know, what we'd like to do is try and maybe uh, enhance the post, once they're graduating, kind of a, you know, a thank you and, a, and potentially a stay in Kamloops and start a business kind of approach. We had a couple of um, people who start businesses over the years, but it hasn't been as, as active as probably the welcome stuff. So that's probably a, a to-do list item still to kind of come. Great. Okay, the next thing that we've really focused on at TRU and in the city <laughs> is uh, intercultural competence training. And it's something we're doing with the students themselves, with faculty, faculty and, and with the community and employers. Um, and, and there's research out there that shows that just by bringing international students to a campus or a community does not mean that intercultural learning will take place. And in, in some cases, if there aren't purposeful interventions to promote intercultural learning and competence, then actually you can have the opposite of the intended effect. So in other words, internationalization as a process, as, a, as something positive, doesn't happen just by recruiting a bunch of international students. You have to, you have to really take some efforts, and we're doing that. TRU has got, um, we're very lucky that we have Dr. Kyra Garson, a renowned uh, intercultural communications and uh, competence expert on our campus, and she facilitates a lot of workshops for faculty and for students. We have a group of students called the Intercultural Council, and they are uh, international students, domestic students, including Aboriginal students, who receive funding from TRU World, the international department, uh, with the purpose of engaging the different cultural groups on campus and creating events that, that encourage intercultural learning. We also, on, on at the university, have uh, come up with a credential called the Global Competency Credential. And this is something that students earn by having intercultural uh, experiences. For example, a student who goes on to study abroad would earn X number of points towards the, this credential. They could demonstrate intercultural learning by, um, by being in uh, group work in certain classes with, inter with, with students from around the world or from other cultures. They could uh, also earn sort of points towards this credential by speaking second or third or in additional languages. Uh, so that's something where we've made an effort to um, recognize and encourage um, intercultural competence and learning and, and, and basically stating to the community and to the students, uh, this is important, learning to work together and learn together is important and we want to recognize those of you who, who have taken the time to, to, to focus on that and who also have uh, reflected on the experience because again the you have to have something purposeful for them to be a, a real benefit and then and a, we also have a real uh, focus at TRU on this idea of comprehensive campus internationalization again this is the idea that you don't just bring students here and expect magic to happen we have to work with faculty it could be as uh, you know in terms of things like making sure that faculty are revisiting their curricula you know our because if all of your references are Canadian, um, that might not that might not suit uh, the needs of, of these learners who have come from all over the world. Uh, finally, I want to point out uh, a really valuable tool that we've been using is something called the Intercultural Development Inventory or IDI, and you can see the web link there. We won't click on it now, but uh, you you might want to jot that down if you if you're not already familiar with it. But in a nutshell, it's a tool that um, allows the, the participants to fill out a survey and that survey then places them on a continuum uh, of mindsets and each mindset is organized around the, the uh, ability of the individual to recognize cultural similarity and difference. And so on the one end, we have, for example, uh, denial, people who simply don't see that culture 
uh, impacts their lives. And they recognize, for example, that there's such a thing as Chinese food and Indian food, but they don't, don't recognize that there might be some cultural values you know, hidden somewhere in the way that food's prepared or in how people eat it and things like that. Uh, and then on the other end, we, we, re we have uh, adaptation people who not only recognize cultural difference, but they actually can adapt their behavior appropriately depending on who, which cultural groups they're working with. We found this to be an incredibly valuable tool when um, working with support staff on campus, with faculty, with the students themselves, and with community groups. And I've been involved with Dr. Kyra Garson in delivering <laughs> workshops for two community groups here in Kamloops. Um, the Elizabeth Fry Society and the Phoenix Center, uh, which came to be as, as a result of something called our Welcoming Communities Initiative. I'm going to hand this over to Arjun to talk a little bit about that Welcoming Communities Initiative because he, he played a major role in it. Well, you know, there was a uh, federal government, I think, initiative around, I mean, it was Prince of Government, I'm not too sure, uh, but it was a government initiative to try to um, uh, get our businesses uh, thinking more around uh, employing people from different communities, and it, and it just wasn't multicultural communities. It was also people from different abilities, um, handicaps, those kinds of things. So um, it was a um, so we facilitated uh, two workshops at the beginning and the end of the process to try and um, see, just sort of see an issue, set it up, and then and sort of do a bit of a, a recap at the end. You know, and, and I think it was useful in the sense that there was um, certainly a lot of people in the community. Uh, who had a good history of, of working in, in this way? Uh, Kamloops, as, as a as a community, has sort of multiculturalism baked in its DNA for the last 150 years. So so much around our First Nations communities. Uh, we had one of the first uh, African Canadian city councillors back in the 1910 1920 era. First Aboriginal MP Len Marchand, and first Chinese uh, Heritage Mayor and Peter Wing back in the 70s. So it's something we kind of have a bit of a history with. But we definitely do have our issues as well in terms of, um, you know, an example of that would be right now some of our Saudi student community uh, when we have young ladies walking around in the cabs or in different kind of dresses and, and the community has different views on that. Uh, definitely it, it can sometimes be a bit of a conflict here and there. Um, so, you know, working through those questions in terms of a dialogue, in terms of having a way of community coming together to talk about those things in a safe and uh, and sort of um, you know sort of open generative kind of a way is what we did in those two dialogues with welcoming communities uh, and certainly I think uh, I'm glad to hear that Kyra and and Andrew had some had some opportunities to uh, post those things because we always wonder after the dialogues what comes of them uh, because these are time limited projects in terms of the staff funding that's sort of supporting them uh, but we also have a very good uh, Kamloops Immigrant Services in Kamloops. Uh, our Immigrant Services Association here is very strong. Uh, came around actually during the days of the 70s with the Vietnamese uh, boat people issue and refugees coming to Canada and, and, and that and that era and then growing from there and really offering so many intercultural services over the years in our community. Um, so that was that was basically that whole initiative. Yeah. Thank you. Now I apologize for this slide being a uh, probably full of more information than you want. Probably. But, <laughs> but basically we just want to identify a number of ways that uh, the University International Student Services support staff orient and facilitate access to a, you know, various things for our international students. So it's not always necessarily a collaboration specifically with the city, but it involves the community. So. Uh, in an earlier slide, we talked, for example, about the the knowing your getting to know your students and their and their goals and their purpose for being here. And I mentioned that uh, our Indian students that are growing in numbers uh, tend to be focused on a pathway to permanent residence. So what we're noticing, for example, is that the first question many students from India ask us when they arrive is not, um, you know, how do I read my course schedule, but how do I get a job? What is this social insurance number I've heard about? Where do I get it? So that's just one example of where we've worked with uh, Services Canada in Kamloops. And they actually recommended to us, because they found themselves being flooded at certain times of year with, with uh, new, new students, they recommended, well, 
could you provide a place up on campus during your orientation and we'll come and set up there and we can issue SIN numbers on the spot to new students. We said, wow, fantastic. That's going to make life so much easier for the students. It's going to reduce one of their stresses and, uh, and it's been a wonderful collaboration. Tax returns, GST credits, and then the big one, CIC, that's Citizenship and Immigration Canada uh, applications uh, for things like study permit extensions, etc. Those are all um, things that, that, as a staff, we need to facilitate access to. Some of them are available in the city through federal or other organizations. Some not, not in the city, but we still help with that. In terms of provincial programs, uh, TRU, we're very proud to be, as far as I know, only the second public post-secondary in the province that offers a, an MSP group plan for our students. Um, and uh, kudos to the University of the Fraser Valley for being the first there. And many universities don't want to touch this. They're, I think they might be afraid of liability and a few other things, but uh, we decided that we would much rather know for sure that every one of our students is covered by medical insurance then leave it up to them. So we work closely with um, the folks uh, at M MSP and we manage that group plan for them. Um, things like driver's licenses, that's another you know, provincial service nearby that we facilitate access to. And in terms of local resources, obviously we, we need to work with the, the medical clinics because prior to an international student being eligible for MSP, we've registered them all in a, in a private medical insurance plan. So we need to uh, assist with students finding the medical clinics and health clinics in town here in Kamloops that will accept their, their medical coverage um, you know, pre-approved so they're not out of pocket and things like that. We've already talked a little bit about the, the housing and um, one of the things that Arjun and I have discussed in the past, and we, we haven't quite got onto this initiative yet, is creating some kind of guide for uh, property owners and managers in the city. And, and what, what, could we, what could we do as a university to, to help assist creating guidelines to reduce uh, issues that come up between international students who are tenants and the property owners? So that's, that's on our to-do list. Public transportation. We've worked well with the, uh, the public buses in, in uh, Kamloops so that when new students arrive, um, they're able to ride the bus even before they get their, what we call a U-Pass, which is their student card, which allows um, riding the bus for free. So we've had some pretty good success there. And legal advice. Every now and again, our students do find themselves uh, in trouble or on the wrong side of the law, and um, we collaborate with people in the city to make sure we get them advice that they need. Uh, club events and activities for social integration. We're really focusing on this and I mentioned the Intercultural Council but we also run an activity program for international students um, which connects them with the kinds of things that Canadians love to do. So there's a lot of outdoorsy stuff, a lot of getting out in a canoe, going up to Sun Peaks, um, going for, for students who are over the age of 19, taking them uh, to tour the wineries uh, in the Okanagan and things like that. Or here. Or here. Yeah, we do have some uh, now a couple of good, three good wineries in the, in the uh, Thompson Four. Um, and so things like that. Um, we've, we've started integrating with, um, or collaborating I should say, with, with a number of organizations in the city to get, get students out and um, accessing the fun things that are happening for them uh, with the idea that if you can connect, you can connect with locals easier if you like and enjoy and know how to do the things that locals like to do. So that's a big part of it. Uh, volunteering opportunities, we're always looking for organizations and we have found so many in Kamloops that provide uh, opportunities for students to volunteer. Uh, so things like the St. John's Ambulance, um, even the, um, uh, their name escapes my mind, the Mounted Patrol in Kamloops. Well, the Mounted, the, the horse guys? Yes. Yeah, Kamloops Mounted Patrol. Kamloops Mounted Patrol. They welcome, they welcome visitors to Kamloops. That's right, things like that. Uh, of course, we're liaising with faith communities and uh, various, we talked about the issue of prayer space. Um, so, you know, we're very lucky that most of the major faith groups have a community in Kamloops and a space. You know, there is now a mosque here, for example. Um, and there have been Sikh temples for quite some time, but we connect students to those 
uh, places, in addition to the fact that we do have a multi-faith chaplaincy on campus. The Kamloops Multicultural Society has been a, a, an important organization that we liaise with. And they're very much involved uh, with the city during uh, Canada Day celebrations. Arjun, maybe you could talk briefly about well, that. Well, just uh, our Multicultural Society in Canada basically runs Canada Day. Uh, it's run by the, by the Multicultural Society, so that's a, a group of all cultural societies in Kamloops. Uh, we have a very, very famous, I would invite you guys in Canada Day to come by for our famous uh, multicultural food booth uh, on Canada Day. And uh, so it's very much a... Uh, multicultural component to our Canada Day. We have people uh, to have within Canada in different languages and, and also on that point uh, the students up here are, are getting more involved with that now where they're coming down and setting up booths and having a strong presence at Canada Day uh, and that's also helping integrate you know into the community so um, again not really a formal formal thing that we do in the city but a very meaningful thing that happens around a city sort of sponsor, a city sort of you know, contracted out, if you will, events of the Multicultural Society uh, to run. And that, our candidate, usually depending on the weather, runs about 30 or 40,000 people in our, our main park, Riverside Park. Yeah. Now, Arjun has already talked a little bit about Kamloops Immigrant Services and, and what a strong um, and excellent organization that is. And, of course, the school district, we, we liaise with them in terms of uh, marketing and recruitment joint efforts. And, uh, and also supports for students. So we're, we're working more uh, with them to bring international students who are in the school district onto the campus at TRU to get them interested in staying here. And I think one success this fall was that we had uh, eight students who converted from, international students who converted from the school district to TRU, which, which does, I think, demonstrate that they want to stay in Kamloops and they're enjoying their time here. Uh, in terms of specific supports on campus, uh, we're seeing more and more pressure from international students uh, to, for the university to provide career education support, to provide co-op job positions, to put on host and host job fairs and career development workshops and, and those sort of things. Uh, our writing center, so back to the idea of co-op, that requires the university to liaise with local businesses because they are the ones who actually provide the job opportunities. And many of them have uh, given just amazing feedback about the quality of uh, worker they're getting in uh, an international student who might be in their third year of their, of their program. Uh, the Writing Center on campus is a place that brings uh, community volunteers who are giving their time to help assist students with <laughs> writing. And, and this is all students, not just uh, international, but we do find that the largest users of the Writing Center are international students, so that's, that's a nice connection there. And the School of Business and Economics at TRU has really done tremendous work in organizing networking and mentoring events where they identify local entrepreneurs, business owners, and they match them together with business students. And uh, we haven't talked about this previously in the webinar, but the School of Business is the, uh, is the faculty on campus that has the largest number of international students. So just the nature of this program means that we're seeing international students being connected with local business owners, and you see them around town. You know, you go to dinner at Earl's and you'll, you'll recognize, oh, there's one of our international students having a one-on-one -on -one, uh, dinner and conversation with one of the most successful entrepreneurs in town. It's really amazing to see. And uh, service learning courses, if you're not familiar with that term, a service learning course is a four-credit course where students get out into the community and volunteer and have learning outcomes attached to what they're doing which they then, you know, have assignments connected to and, and, and that's evaluated and for credit. And uh, Arjun can talk a little bit about some of the experience he's had with uh, service learning students in the city of Kamloops. Yeah, I mean, so I, as a city councillor, I uh, did, uh, I'm really keen on this, this course. I think it's a really important um, uh, thing for, it's come out of actually international education at TRU, but it obviously can be for any kind of student, uh, but it really gets people out in the community learning off campus, uh, being part of the greater, you know, uh, community. And what I had, um, I had um, uh, two international students actually work with me, uh, and one really went quite far down the line of actually trying to help plan a car sharing uh, program in Kamloops and give it over to a community group, which is still 
working on getting it set up. Um, so, and and what you found uh, with Lydia, with Karen, the young lady from Eastern Columbia that I work with, uh, is that you know really really interested, really really um, you know very very punctual, wants to really you know show showcase uh, w what her abilities are, uh, and I think that that's a really great way for also uh, people from international sort of student communities, which typically in my in my, in my experience tend to sort of come together. They don't really, there's not a lot of mixing sometimes between different communities as far as I can see. So it gets them out into the larger community, meeting people from outside their cultural group and building relationships and friendships out there. So really awesome and uh, something I would definitely recommend any university I take up. And then finally, we just have a point here about leadership programs on campus and the importance of those. And one of my observations has been, uh, particularly with the Saudi students, because of their sponsorship program, they were actually uh, not, they are forbidden uh, from, from working, from paid employment. Um, but they really, many, so many of them strongly desi uh, desired the opportunities to volunteer and to gain leadership skills. So specific programs that can be developed on campus or in the community that are non-paid but that are focused on developing leadership skills uh, will be you know, very much appreciated by many international students. So yeah, thanks, Peter, for the slide. Um, so we're, Ada and I were talking a bit about some of the more some of the more formal things that happen with the city. As we said, this is kind of more of a, a it's more of informal as they need the city. You know, we get involved, but we do have some significant uh, programs in the international realm that are span a lot of years. Uh, Twenty five years of a sister city relationship with a, a town in Japan called Uji. Uh, we're actually five of us from our council and some community members traveling there next week for our uh, once every two year uh, trip. It's a very special trip for us this year because it's 25 years of relationship. We have certainly had Uji students in TRU and in the school district. The city of Kamloops actually sends a uh, educa uh, an English teacher every year to the Uji uh, high schools, I believe, to teach English there. Um, so and so every second year they're here. The alternate year we're there. And it depends who can make it for the trip and that kind of thing. Usually, not so many politicians go. It's, it's a big one this year, so a bunch of us are going. And uh, it really is a, uh, a hallmark of uh, one of our international things we do in the city is it's quite formal. Our Japanese community, culturally, in Kamloops is very invested in that program. TRU is very invested in that program. Um, and, uh, and it really works very well, I think, from that perspective. Um, Protocol functions we've already covered uh, pretty well. We have two economic development sort of functions, maybe three in the city. Uh, Venture campus, our economic development arm, and uh, obviously there has been some. Uh, the TRU, when they market, when they host international students, they have brochures and information around what we're doing around helping businesses set up or retain businesses in Kamloops. And our tourism, um, our tourism end, uh, which is Tourism Kamloops, which uh, has a um, a staff and a budget to sort of promote tourism opportunities in town. You see a lot of our students actually, in, in my experience, uh, do work in the hotels uh, after, uh, as a side uh, job or after graduation. I find a lot of them, see them again in the hospitality industry, which I think is really uh, a great thing for us and the community, hopefully good for them too. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, just our whole sports hosting and our sports focus in Canvas with German Capital branding that we have. So uh, a lot of people, I think, really come here and they get into physical fitness. They, they are able to look at, watch and participate in quite high quality uh, sporting events. And you know, whatever brand you have as a community, you can build on that, I think, to attract, uh, you know, have a bit of an edge for people who would enjoy what your community offers or what your college or what your particular situation offers. Uh, we're, we're really big here in Kamloops on on sports hosting and sports and physical fitness and health and wellness just generally. So I see a lot of international students in the gym at the Terman Capital Center and they're getting quite fit and it makes me very happy. So uh, yeah. Thanks Arjun. I'm just going to jump in and with one little story about the uh, value of collaboration with Venture Kamloops. They often host events uh, on our campus and in one of these networking events uh, I was introduced to, to a local fellow who was starting um, a business from the ground up where he he was sourcing uh, drills that were going to be used in the mining industry in China. 
but he needed somebody to translate some manuals for him and he didn't have he wasn't at the stage in his business yet where he could afford to reach out to a you know a large translation firm so he just asked you know would you know anybody and I said well yeah in fact I know about 600 people who could help and uh, we approached some some students and it was great because we were assisting a local uh, you know budding entrepreneur who was just at the very beginning of, um, of, of his venture which hopefully grows into something big and employs people and brings some prosperity here in Kamloops but we were also providing that very first opportunity for a Chinese international student studying business to have a real life interaction and do something that they were going to get paid for but also were probably going to learn a tremendous amount from and something they could add to their resume and portfolio. Um, finally, I just want to talk briefly about some gaps in support for international students or some you know the other side of the coin is viewing them as opportunities for intentional support. That's my view. Yeah, we have we have some issues with things like the rigidity with rules and definitions. So PR meaning permanent resident, international student, refugee claimant, for example. So you know we 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 give people labels in um, at the university, and and this impacts the support they get. One example is we talked about Kamloops Immigrant Services and as a settlement agency they receive funding from the federal government and that funding is only to support people who are permanent residents, landed immigrants. So when you are an international student you get support from the university. When you are a permanent resident you get support from the settlement agency like Kamloops Immigrant Services. But what happens to you during that period of time after you've graduated and you're here on your three-year post-grad work permit, you're a temporary foreign worker. So there's a big gap, whereas the university, we want to extend our support even though they're no longer students. And Kamloops Immigrant Services has been uh, exceptional, about, exceptional, exceptional about always having their door open for people and never turning anyone away even though technically they're not allowed to. So we've got some issues there and that's where the close relationship with the community organizations is really important. Another example of a gap is that uh, CIC, Citizenship and Immigration Canada, <laughs> they state, uh, and you can find this on their website, that if you're an international student in Canada that your child can, can, uh, can can participate in K to 12 education um, free of charge, but the problem is uh, education is a provincial it's a provincial jurisdiction, and the province of BC has um, has said that it's up to each individual school board to determine if they're going to charge tuition or not to children of of post-secondary international students. So we've got a bit of a gap there, and that requires collaboration between the school districts and uh, the universities and colleges and, and private schools. And then another issue we have in terms of a, an opportunity is to come up with funding for international students in financial need. There is an expectation that international students are coming with a lot of money. And in many cases that is true. And they, in order to get a visa or a study permit to Canada, a student and their family does need to demonstrate that they have the funds to get the student through their, their program of choice. However, we know that uh, in, the, in the real world situations change, tragedies can occur to a family or to the, the funding source. We have sponsored students who then lose their sponsorship and now they're in Canada. We have uh, natural disasters that occur overseas and impact um, the, the way a student may receive their funding. And we're also seeing more and more, and I think particularly about students from India, we're seeing students who are taking loans, student loans, back home. And I think, uh, I often think about the pressure that a student from India must feel when they've borrowed so many rupees to pay for a Canadian dollar education. If they're not successful, and they have to go home and pay off that loan, but they can now only earn rupees, not dollars. What stress that puts on them. And uh, typically, the scholarships that are available for international students tend to be um, uh, they tend to be entrance awards used to attract students, but not to retain them, or not to retain students in financial needs. So there's definitely more work to be done there, and perhaps collaboration with sources of funding in the community.
Uh, we could do more to engage disengaged groups on campus. Certain cultural groups tend to hang out with one another and, uh, and not integrate as well. There's more work to be done there. Uh, perhaps liaising with the multicultural society or other cultural organizations in the city. And this idea of open learning or online learning, uh, if you're not p familiar with the term MOOC, that stands for Massive Open Online Course. Essentially, that is a free online course um, that, that uh, could be delivered all over the world. And one of the things Arjun and I were talking about just last week was what if we worked together to de develop a course that introduced newcomers to Kamloops pre-arrival to the history of the city, the region, the province, and to what to expect when they get here and what supports are available. And we could offer that free of charge through the university as an online course. So that I think that would be tremendously uh, valuable. And Arjun already talked about trying to retain you know, parents and family. And so we, maybe we would work more on an orientation for parents and family, not just focusing on the individual student, and also in terms of the follow-up. When the parents show up for graduation, for the convocation ceremony, what could we do together with the city to, to um, even though it's not a welcome, but to continue to welcome them and encourage them to stay? Uh, basically, that's, that's it for us. I, I jotted down this quote when I was at a conference last year that uh, Minister Alexander said, integration takes place in the classroom, in the hallways, in the library. And I took the liberty of adding a few more points and in the streets, in homestays, in university residence, residences, at the grocery store, on co-op work terms, at student club events, in activity programs, at major city events, on the internet, and we could go on and on. So I want to thank all of you. I hope, hopefully you're still awake and not, uh, not in a post-lunch siesta. And uh, we're ready for uh, any questions if you have any. Awesome. Thank you so much both. Uh, really loved all of the uh, the real world anecdotes that you were able to share about how, you know, how really how clearly successful um, uh, the two of you have been uh, with your respective organizations in, in making, um, uh, you know, not only uh, the TRU campus, but Kamloops and, and the region as a whole as, as such a, a welcoming environment for, for international students. That's really great to hear. We do have quite a few questions that have come in, and uh, I'll start from the top and work away down. We've got about 15 minutes here. Um, Pamela asks, uh, we can determine classroom capacity and dormitory capacity. Is there any way to determine community capacity? Well, I, maybe I'll just jump in and say, uh, I know that work has been done by, I think, by the Canada Homestay Network and some other groups on determining not exactly community capacity, but specifically the capacity of the community to host international students in a homestay program. And I can tell you that uh, I can't remember the exact ratio of, uh, you know, uh, residents to students, but we have blown past that probably threefold here at TRU and it's a question we ask a lot because we do at certain peak times, for example the month of July, we have a a lot of pressure to host short-term non-credit specialized training groups from around the world and um, I believe last summer we placed uh, about 380 students in the month of July in homes in Kamloops and Kamloops is a city of approximately 90,000 people. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say for sure that uh, we have a pretty strong uh, hosting ability in Kamloops, you have to develop that over time also develop, I mean, you know, whatever cultural groups you have might be a good way of starting also that notion of, you know, community capacity in terms of understanding multicultural communities. Great, thanks both. Um, David asks, and, and this is in reference, uh, Catherine, to one of your slides there, I think just with the, the breakdown of the, the types of international students in BC. D uh, David asks, curious if, there, if there's any explanation in the drop in private language school participants over the last two years? There was a decrease between 2013-14, uh, as noted on the slide. Um, there, there potentially could be several reasons for that, uh, being uh, certain uh, issues with visa refusals, um, delayed processing times, um, <laughs> uh, challenge uh, implications as well as uh, implementation of reforms to the uh, international student program. 
at a federal level, which in turn uh, British Columbia, all provinces and territories um, had to provide the federal government with a list of designated institutions um, who, were, who were now able to host international students on study permits. So some of those changes uh, potentially did have an impact on that sector as well. Um, I think though going forward, it looks like those, uh, that decrease has rebounded um, in, in the future years. So we're happy to see that positive growth. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and again, uh, I'm thinking this is in reference to uh, your slides, Catherine. Alan is asking, who is marketing the programs overseas? Uh, no more specifics given for that, but but I would just, uh, I'll, I'll let you run with that. Maybe it makes more sense in your context. Uh, sure. Well, first of all, in the schools and institutions do the majority of marketing. They're, they are traveling all the time, they are promoting themselves, they have agents who promote themselves in market, and they work very hard to do that. Uh, to support them, the government did hire um, education marketing managers, so those are individuals I mentioned are um, hired by the Ministry of International Trade, and they're located in offices in China, India, Japan, and Korea. So their job is not to promote specific programs, although they do have a knowledge of programs. Their job is to promote British Columbia as a study destination, uh, the high quality education we have, the many benefits of coming to British Columbia to study. Uh, they also support our schools and institutions in market. So for example, if an institution is planning to visit uh, Korea, that education marketing manager can provide support and help identify meetings. Um, and they also do participate in a number of events. Um, and again, they, they often do, uh, do um, gather support, or sorry, they often do do a kind of a more coordinated approach to events. And so they may have seven or eight institutions who are interested in, uh, in attending, and they will, co they will coordinate and organize that. Um, in addition to the education marketing managers, we have the British Columbia Council for International Education. Uh, so they're a Crown Corporation. Uh, they do a lot of work with promoting British Columbia uh, through the coordination of um, Team BC Missions Abroad. So, uh, for example, when Minister, former Minister Burke traveled to India in fall, uh, BCCIE led the education delegation um, and, and had a number, set up a number of roundtables, meetings, um, where again they were promoting British Columbia as a study destination. We also have the the ministry has a, a website, an international education website, Learn the BC, that has information for international students and parents who are interested in coming to British Columbia, and that website is translated to a number of languages. And BCCIE also has a, a website promoting British Columbia, and again information about studying and learning here in British Columbia as well as potential work opportunities for international students. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, this is a question for Adrian. Uh, Pamela asks, what percentage of your total student body is that 1,700-500 international, or 1,750 international students? Uh, well, it always depends uh, who you're asking for numbers, but um, and which semester we're talking about. In a fall semester, which is our, our largest semester on campus at TRU, it's, it's approximately 20%. Hmm. Great. Um, uh, Lucas. Uh, Lucas is saying, uh, TRU has started from humble beginnings and is truly earning a well-deserved and frankly awesome reputation here in BC. However, a student in a country such as China, where reputation is everything, may not have heard of TRU or even Kamloops. What sort of things do you do to attract students to TRU, especially in a place where TRU or Kamloops may not be as well known as other Canadian post-secondary institutions, specifically UBC, SFU, or UVic? Well, that's first of all, that's a huge question, and it's it's one better directed to our marketing and recruitment team. But uh, but I'll jump in and, and uh, try and add something here. Um, it really depends on the market that we're talking about. In China, for example, uh, the students and more importantly their parents tend to be very much focused on name recognition and ranking. So when they're once they've made the decision to come to Canada, um, it's 
it's tough to even market BC because they're going to think, I want to see the list of the top ranked universities in Canada. They're likely going to end up with the Maclean's Magazine ranking and see U of T at number one, et cetera. So you've got to find a way to uh, make a splash. You've got to find a way to educate the key people who influence the students' decisions about why your institution is a good place. So, I mean, our one of our big selling points at TRU is the amazing array of support that we have for students. Um, but that's not always what the student or the parents think is important. So we need to identify in China, for example, who influences the student decision. If it's a student, for example, in a BC offshore school, each school has a unique culture. We need to identify, is it the BC principal and vice principal who are influencing the students? In some of those schools, you can go to a university fair and the principal will tap a, a student on the shoulder and say, Jimmy, you really need to talk to my friend from TRU over here. I think Kamloops and TRU would be a great place for you. You're a good match. That can go a long way. But in other, in other schools, it might be a Chinese counselor making those decisions or and this happens uh, more often than not, it's an agency that the students and their families are using to help match them with, with a university and apply to a university and apply for their visa um, that is influencing their decisions. So what we do at TRU is we use a network of agents and we hold agent training sessions. So it's important for us to be on the ground in many of those markets to walk into those agents' offices, make sure they know the latest information about our programs that we're offering, the supports that we offer, because more often than not, a student and a family are walking into that agent's office and saying, little Johnny wants to go to Canada, where should we go? So that's a, that's a key thing to do. UBC and, and UVic, they're not working with agents, they don't have to worry about that, they have their branding and their, their, their ranking, but smaller institutions like TRU and many others, we have to work a little bit harder. That's one of or several of the things that we, w we would need to do. Great, thanks for that. Um, Danielle asks, um, do you have a centralized international education office that includes recruitment, admission, student services, student engagement, partnerships, etc., or do you partner with your domestic equivalents, wondering about the size of your staff? We are very lucky at TRU. We, we do have a centralized approach, um, although we don't have everything on that list in our office. In TRU world right now, we have International Student Services. We have the Study Abroad Office, which is also supporting domestic students who want to study abroad. We have our transnational education, which is working on partnerships, uh, 2 plus 2 programs, for example. Um, we have our International Training Center. That's the short-term uh, non-credit stuff. Uh, and we have our marketing and recruitment team. Um, the actual international admissions office is in a separate location, housed in the registrar's office, but with very strong uh, liaison. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm the individual that liaises with that office, and at various times that office has reported to the international department. I think if you asked your colleagues uh, from international departments around the province, uh, what model would they prefer to see? I understand this is a bit controversial, so if there's any registrars in the room, please uh, close your ears. But, uh, I think we would find it better for recruitment and conversion of applications if the if the international admissions office was reporting to the international department. That seems to be the most efficient way. Just my bias, perhaps. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Uh, another question here from Alan. He asks, are there any resources available through the province to help develop new international student programs? Catherine, I'll turn that one over to you. They are there to support all sectors, so that's public, private, K-12, and the, the language sector as well. Um, there's also the British Columbia Council for International Education. Uh, they also are, their mandate is to support all sectors. So those are great resources for, um, for schools or institutions who are looking to uh, get, break into new markets or who have any questions about international education or recruitment of students, etc. Um, and their contact information, either they can contact me for it or it is also available um, through the British Columbia Council for International Education. They, that list 
yeah, education record manager's contact information. Um, so, like I said, those are those are two great resources uh, where where someone could go to find support. And Catherine, for those that uh, do want to get in touch with you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, through my email address. Um, so I could I could just say it right now. It's my name. So it's uh, Catherine Bolak, uh, K A T H R Y N dot Bolak, B E A U L A C, at gov dot bc dot ca. Thanks very much. And for those of you that may not have been able to jot that down quite quickly enough, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available about a week from today, available on our website. Uh, to those of you who have registered, you'll receive a link to that recording uh, in about a week's time as well. That is all the questions that uh, that we've had come in. Valentina did ask a question, but it was essentially the same as uh, as Alan, so I'll, I'll consider that one answered. Uh, Valentina, if that didn't quite hit the mark, uh, do feel free to email Catherine, and, uh, and she can help you out with that, I'm sure. Um, Arjun, Adrian, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. That was uh, some really great insights as to, you know, really the, the sheer vastness that is uh, international education to our economy and all of the, um, you know, the fun ways that you can grow that sector and also your community as well in, in a really meaningful way. So uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and thank you to everyone on the line who's joined us to participate today. If, uh, if there are any other follow-up questions, uh, I think that um, Adrian and Arjun have provided their contact info as well as Catherine. Um, but uh, I think that's it. And until next time, thanks very much. Take care. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Bye. Catherine. Bye.